Here's the, you know, 315 things that real estate agents do in a transaction, right? And it's like, set up a search, show homes, blah, blah, blah. That's not value. That's what comes with the transaction. That's what comes with working with the realtor. You have to show property. You have to set up a search, right? You have to uh, schedule showings. You have to negotiate. That's not value. If that's value, we're in trouble because everyone can do that. AI can do some of that stuff now. Welcome back to Nevada Realtors Today, your place for timely updates on the news and trends that matter to realtors in the Silver State. Now let's join your Nevada Realtors President, Brandon Roberts, and Nevada Realtors CEO, Tiffany Banks, for today's episode of Nevada Realtors Today. So we are here today with the incredible, amazing Tommy Choi, who is a realtor in Chicago for over 17 years. Um, was the National Association of Realtors Vice President of Association Affairs in 2021. And beyond that, I am not going to say anything else about you because you're just an incredible human. And actually, let me start off with this. I wasn't going to share this, but I was on a podcast a week ago. And one of the questions that they asked me was, who's in your front row? Like, not people. Oh, I love that. Uh, yeah, and it wasn't like a current thing. It was just like, name somebody or a couple people that for a long time, you felt like have supported you on your journey. And so I actually named you. Stop. I named you. All right, I'm going to fact check that. I'm you are, check you the receipts. And, and I named Tyler and Dave. So there's three of you that would be in my front row. And I said, when I said it was because I feel like you guys have encouraged me to show up as like my most authentic self when I've had doubts of, Am I showing up in the right way as a leader? Or is this the right move for me? What should I do this? You guys have been this great sounding board for me of continue to be who you are and like trust that. And so anyway, this intro now turned about me, but it really actually <laughs> you know what? about you. I love uh, one. Thank you for that's very kind of you to say that. And um, I'm grateful to be in your front row. And I'll tell you this. We all know there's no shortcuts in life. But what I've learned is the greatest accelerator in business and personal life are through people. And the people you choose to surround yourself with can boost you, catapult your speed and trajectory. And that's why it's so important, right? And that's why I'm grateful. I call those people my locker room, but I kind of like the front row thing, but people in my locker room. So like Tiffany, Brandon, I consider you two a part of my locker room. You're people I like to spend time with not just because you're positive and optimistic, but you're you're real, right? Uh, accountability is something that's important. I always say the people you spend the most time with, if they are not challenging you to raise the bar on the standards that you hold yourself to, you have to find new people. Hmm. That's plain and simple. And, um, you know, that's why I always like to be around people that are going to keep it real with me. My, one of my, Good Buddies, who's also a business partner of mine uh, in a coaching company. His name is Amir. And Amir, I've known for a long time. And he's someone who's in my locker room who holds me accountable. And what I mean by that is the first, he's one of the first people I saw um, during the pandemic. Once Chicago opened up, we, we were like in like a 90 day lockdown and we went out for lunch and, you know, we hug each other. And you think the first thing, right, he would say, oh, my God, it's so great to see you. Literally, the first thing he said to me was like, dude, did you work out at all this last three months? Like, you're looking chubby. And the fact was, I didn't. All I did was eat frozen pizzas during those 90 days. It was actually kind of great. But that's what I'm talking about, right? Keeping your real uh, range. Keep, not even just keeping me in check, but raising the bar and the standards we choose, uh, we, we hold ourselves to. And, and guess what? I was like, shit, you're right. I got to get back in the gym. And that's where I feel like right now, especially with how... Everything, all the the uncertainty in our industry, right? People challenging, you know, what we do, whether it's, you know, opportunistic attorneys or the DOJ or even misinformation in the media. I think it's so important to really be surrounding yourself with the right people that are focused and want to continue to move on, right? What I've learned I've known this in life, but what I've learned, especially in the last, like, I don't know, let's just call it like two years almost during this whole lawsuit compensation suit thing 
is that there's two types of real estate agents. There's foghorns and there's lighthouses, right? And foghorns are like people that are loud and chaotic when they can't see in front of them. They're being as loud as they can so people can move away from them, right? And then there's lighthouses who stand tall, right? And guide people to safety, right? Guide people in the direction that they need to go in or uh, are away from hazards and whatnot. And I think right now, when you talked about people being in your front row, or as I say, the people in your locker room, they have to be lighthouses, right? Uh, because you want those people that are going to continue to make you better. Yeah, and I think there's a time and place for the foghorn person, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, maybe if there's a true emergency, you want those people to say alarm, alarm, because maybe we'd be, you know, over here creating something and not look up to notice. But yeah, having the lighthouses and and truly like people that have not just support you as a person, but actually have like great information to share. And I all actually love sitting down with people that think way differently than than I do. Because then I'm like, what can I learn from this person? Like, I like to be challenged in that way because I definitely don't think I know it all. But I love it if they actually have like super different views because I'm yes. like, okay, great perspective that I never would have thought about because I'm just living in my own brain. Totally. 100%. You know, there was, I think it was a president circle conference that had Condoleezza Rice mm -hmm. speaking. And one of the things that she said that was so powerful to me is how she talked about, you know, her first, you know, first row or uh, front row or locker room and how she looks at a red flag when everyone around her is continually always agreeing with her, mm -hmm. right? She wants the people that will challenge her. Right. And kind of make her think differently and whatnot. And she said, that's the biggest thing you want to look out for is when the people you surround yourself are constantly like saying, oh, you're great. No, no, no. That was good. Blah, blah, blah. Someone's not telling the truth. Right. Well, we like and, that too. I like what I like a call pumping me up if I've had a bad day. Even you if you that. don't believe it, just say it. <laughs> Brandon, totally. actually, that's a question for you. And you don't have to think on the spot, but I have a question. Who would be in your front row? Because, and again, it's like somebody, they said you couldn't be your family member, couldn't, not a like present day mentor, but like just somebody that just pops in your head as somebody that's like been there to support you kind of from your beginning of your journey. I, I think uh, I'd have to put you on the top of that list, Tiffany. I think just going into what we've gone into this year and the support and the direction and stuff and how you've helped me stay focused on the goal, it's, it's been huge. I'd say uh, Tom Blanchard's another big one, as, uh, and most people wouldn't realize how much of an influence he has on people uh, in a good way. Uh, he's good. And then, when, like Tommy, when you say people that don't agree with you all the time, I, I think I'd have to say Chris Bishop. Um, he is, uh, he's my general manager, but I think we argue about a lot of things, you know, and just cause I own the company doesn't mean it goes my way. Um, but it causes you to look at things in a different, in, in a different manner. And I think society today would be better if we took that even outside of business, just in politics and everything, yes. um, just being more open-minded to listen to other people's side of things. Right. I, I call that intellectual sparring. I always tell our team or a group I'm with, when we're challenging each other, right? And part of it's creating that space. So it's like, listen, it's okay. Like we, we're still like, like each other. It's okay to not agree with one another. It's intellectually sparring where we're, you know, we're just sparring in the gym. This isn't like the real main event here. We're doing this to think differently, push ourselves and get better. And we're just sharing insight and thought. And I think that's like the best. I love, uh, that's why purposely in meetings, I don't like to give my thoughts um, first because what I've noticed is sometimes, right? You have um, and I, there's a, there's a there's a formal um, thing they call this the idea around this, but it's like you know if, if we're talking about something, I give my thought first, and maybe I'm the person that's you know on top of the totem pole here in hierarchy. That might affect the way you, Tiffany, and you, Brandon want to respond because you want to kind of agree with me and whatnot. So that's, I, I'm always also like going last because I, I don't want to like influence other people's thoughts. I like hearing what people have to say, like truly uncut, you know? 
It's actually fascinating the people that aren't the first to talk, like Brandon's a perfect example. Like I, I watch him in situations where I know he's going to speak up, but then somebody else is louder and more vocal. Mm -hmm. But then it's like Brandon's holding the nugget that you really want to hear. And he's saying it and delivering it in such a way that's going to be meaningful. But yet he's overpowered though. When he finally speaks, you're like, ah, like, thank you for speaking up. But I think that it's just interesting, like different types of people's personalities in that. So Brandon, yeah. thank you for being you and for speaking up when you do. I just, I like to listen, you know, and it's, uh, so yeah, sometimes I'm a little slower to speak, but uh, I, I like to take it in all first, um, like you said, because then you don't influence people. Do you kind of know where they sit? And then you can make your argument. So that's good. Um, are you seeing, um, I, I mean, we've we obviously have had the the settlement and things went into effect on august 17th i mean how are the agents in your market uh, reacting or adapting to this are you seeing a lot of change as the market crashed what's going on in chicago you know what that's such a great question and you know i feel like i have not um I think a lot of people got worked up, right? The unknown is always, you know, something that people are afraid of. And this ominous date of August 17th that was on all of our calendars, it kind of reminded me of like, um, like remember Y2K? And everyone was like, you know, going to the store and like getting bottles of water and whatnot. And then, you know, the clock struck midnight. It's like, oh, we're still all here. I feel like that's what agents are, at least in the Chicago market. They're like, okay, cool. We're still here. We adapt. We move forward. And, you know, honestly, the changes in my opinion, and, and at least like, you know, uh, from a buyer broker agreement standpoint, you know, we've, we've always had those and, and granted, have we used it, you know, the, with the intent it's meant to have fully, probably not, but we have focused in on it the last, um, since Q4 of last year, staying ahead of that. And that. I think it just brings more transparency um, to the transaction. It lays out the trust and fully commits the relationship between the client and the agent. I think it just ends up being a better um, overall relationship, you know, from it. So that part's been good. Um, and you know, the the offers of compensation not be on the MLS. Uh, I don't think there's been issues with it right now. Now it's just all you know. You you just kind of negotiated the one thing i will tell you that personally right i'm gonna get my soapbox here um give my hot take people have been calling non-stop right on our listings or texting email like, hey are you offering compensation whatever whatever and you answer it but then after like my 60th like call especially that first weekend in my head i'm just like what does it matter it does not matter what i tell you what i whether it's a yes or no because you just presenting the offer now you know and you make it a part of the offer and, you know, you, you negotiate that. And whether the seller is offering it or not, you just build it in now, right? And uh, you make it part of the deal. So that part I've started to now change. So I used to leading into August 17th, that was something that was really like, man, we got to really clearly communicate this and whatnot. And now it's just like, yeah, my client's offering compensation presented in the offer and, and, and we'll figure it out. Right. Um, I think the most important thing in my opinion is, and this is just me wearing Tommy Choi, you know, top realtor in Chicago sold over a billion dollars in the last 17 years, right? Nothing, no other title is, I still think it's super important for the real estate agent in that listing appointment to not just discuss their compensation, but also explain and discuss what it means to have buyer compensation as well. And I think um, some places are going the, I think the easy route, maybe, I don't know if it's fair for me to say the lazy route to just worry about their side and just say, yeah, and then, you know, we'll figure out the buyer side. If someone asks for it, then, you know, we'll negotiate it. I think it's still important. We're still treating it like how it was before, where we are explaining like, hey, here, here's what I recommend if it's your choice, but here's what I recommend. Here's why. Uh, because it really still, I think, protects professionalism, in my opinion, 
right? And making sure that the consumer understands really the only thing that changes in this rule is that we just can't talk about offers of compensation on the MLS. Nothing else really changes from that standpoint. Um, because that's where I think all the confusion is coming in in the media that, you know, they got, they've gone away, period, right? Or they're fully decoupled now, which isn't true. So um, that's that's kind of my hot take on that. And 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 I hope that many people continue to to do that um, and practice that conversation, because I do think it's important to protect our professionalism and integrity when it comes to co-oping with each other. I think they will. I, I think that it's a good opportunity for our industry to get better. Uh, mm -hmm. With the communication and actually getting the consumer to actually understand our value all the way around. So I, too, believe that, um, you know, life's going on and we haven't seen a big disruption minus the, the first fact of the buyer's agents wondering how they were going to get paid. But in the end, it still all happens the same. We just get there a different way. Yeah, totally. Have, have you had issues with um, or not even issues, but challenges? or pushback with agents on like having difficulty discussing the buyer broker agreements with their clients or hesitation around it? Um, the ones that are having trouble are the ones that are presenting it, basically saying, Hey, I need this sign so you can see a house. Yes. Um, I think that's, that's a wrong way to go to about it. it. Yep. You've got to sit down and give them a presentation or a buyer's consultation, go through the process, explain your value, explain what you're going to do. And then you, then they don't have a problem. Yeah, but it's it's the one nobody wants to sign something so that you get paid. They want to sign something because there's value. That's why yeah. they're going to hire you. So, so what we've learned uh, in in doing this, like I said, you know, since like the end of last year, I mean, and we've used them before, but we never really fully went all in on the compensation side. But here's the framework we follow, right? And I'll I'll, I'll give it I'll lay it all out on how we do it is the framework in the conversation when you talk about the, the buyer broker agreement is what, why, who, and how. And when we go through this, and I'll go through each one, it's really closed the loop on this conversation where people, buyers fully understand, right? So what is, the, what, is, what is the buyer broker agreement? And it's explaining what it is and that it's not something that's new. It's always, it's been around for at least the last 20 years. And during the what is when we explain also due to this compensation lawsuit, this is part of the settlement that these are now required in order to see properties that are off the MLS. And, and in the state of Illinois, starting January of next year, it's a part of license law too. So we can add that layer into it. Then during the why, and this is to your point, Brandon, where I see a lot of people um, fail forward and we failed forward on this and we had to reverse engineer it. They, during the why do we need this, they use it as, well, because of this lawsuit settlement, now it's required and we had to do that. And that's not the reason why a consumer is going to feel confident in signing this, right? The why for us is now explaining that this establishes our trust in each other. Right. I'm committed. Right. We're explaining our fiduciary duties, dual agency, what that is, and the compensation piece. I'm committed to spending my time, energy, and resources in helping you achieve your dream, right? Of home ownership, the American dream. I'm asking for you in from you in return the same commitment in this relationship, right? Why we need this is it establishes that so we can both be set up for success. And then the who is when we get to the compensation part. Who pays? And I think that's very important. We learn, right? It's saying, hey, we're going to ask the seller first uh, to uh, take care of this compensation. In the case that they don't or they are uh, only doing some of it, that difference uh, is your responsibility. And then here's where we added this language two months ago from learning from this uh, when we had a client. Um, uh, who had to exercise a difference that had come out of pocket and, and it and it completely like changed the tone of the the um the deal is how how are you gonna pay this if you have to pay this? And at that point, it's important to explain, well, you're literally either bringing more cash to the table, we can ask for some sort of closing cost credit or maybe a seller concession. Um, you know, explaining the different ways that 
they can do this. Now, after that, what we found is there's no questions. They understand. And in the situations we've had, we've had a handful where there was no compensation offer from the seller or it was less than what our buyer broker agreement said. It was like, cool, you you said that this could happen. And you said, if this happens, this is how we could handle it. So let's figure out which route we want to go, right? And so it makes things so much clearer. And that's what the framework we follow now is what, who, how, uh, I'm sorry, what, why, how, who, and how. Mm-hmm. I saw you taking notes, Brandon. I think that that's awesome. And and I think, I do think that sometimes if you lay it out in, and, and what we're trying to do, I think, at the end of the day is simplify, right? Not complicate. Mm-hmm. And so I think if you're able to simplify for the consumer and show up in a way that's like, this is what I want you to understand, we all can understand it in that way. So I think that that's, that's great. Everything we do is trying to simplify rather than overly complicate. Totally. Fancy, fail, simple scales. The, the more simple you can keep things, the more you can scale and grow that. And it, honestly, even like answering when people ask, you know, I've literally, I think since the Selma date, I've personally gone like 70 listing appointments. There hasn't been one s- seller who uh, didn't ask me about this lawsuit and what that means for them, right? I think what's important in that, and it's wild to me when I ask like even my team at the time and like people in my office, like how there's no one similar answer. And some of the stuff is just like, it's like that scene in Billy Madison, you know, when they're doing the debate and, you know, the guy's like, I award you no points, right? It was literally like, what? You just a word vomit. (laughs) And none of that is answering the question. What I found helps, right? And that's part of us as natural leaders. We want to naturally just say, okay, cool, grab my hand and let's go, right? I'll explain this to you. But I think a very unique skill that some leaders have, and especially in this time, it's very important, is to ask your client how they like to be led before leading, right? And how they like to be led in this situation is always just asking like, oh, you know what, Brandon, that's a really great question. I'm glad you asked that. Before I answer, can I ask you, what's your understanding of the lawsuit and what's going on? That's the most important thing because ultimately you want to understand what their preconceived notion is of it. They might be completely right or they might be completely wrong or they might not even know. So you want to be able to make sure you're answering that question, right? And then it's just being simple and direct about what it is. You don't have to like tiptoe around it or like use all these fancy words I think the more the the more simple you can be and the more direct you can, that's all the client wants. They just want to know that you know your stuff, right? And then they're like, great, okay, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining it. Yeah, you're not telling them to trust you. You're showing them how to trust you. Right, totally. So what I've really been interested and fascinated in lately with with a lot of the content that you're putting out and and the stories that you're telling, and I don't know if I, if we've even chatted about this, but I'm finding that um, a lot of the content is is really like these authentic stories of situations that you're dealing with or taking place with you, internal thoughts, and so. I just like want to commend you, number one, for showing up like authentically like that, because I, I love I like love reading it. And I said to Brandon, I need to send you screenshots of what he writes, because it's it's like things that we don't share. Right. Like usually like either, you know, we want to share in our successes. It's a lot harder to share in things that have been hard on us or that show us in a different light. So what is sharing in that authentic way done for you as a leader? And how do you think other agents can do that better to connect uh, with their clients or other agents? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Storytelling is the ultimate, um, I think, the most powerful way to convey value. Okay. And when you, and why I say that is because your story is one of one right? It's it's authentic to you. And when you can sit down and, and take time to just look at your journey, reflect back on it and pull from your life experiences, there's connections that you can use those, right? I look at it as like, like imagine having like an empty bookshelf and 
you just filling that bookshelf with different stories from your lived experiences. When you can take time to categorize and have those stories there, then you know when to use them, right? It's just like, it's like um, if you play golf, it's having knowing your stories is then knowing that if you're, you know, for me, 150 yards away, cool, I'm going to pull out a nine iron, right? And knowing what club you can use. And especially now when value is something that's super important to the real estate agent and conveying it, you need, I think it's very unique and an important way to convey that in storytelling. There was this post that went viral that was like, uh, like here's the, you know, 315 things that real estate agents do in a transaction, right? And it's like, set up a search, show homes, blah, blah, blah. That's not value. That's what comes with the transaction. That's what comes with working with the realtor. You have to show property. You have to set up a search, right? You have to uh, schedule showings. You have to negotiate. That's not value. If that's value, we're in trouble because everyone can do that, right? And AI can do some of that stuff now. The value is, once again, what's unique to your journey and, and how you can use storytelling and how I would empower the audience to do so is... Um, let me ask Tiffany, what what's your what's your favorite food to eat? Um, pizza. Okay. Ask me what thin my favorite crust, food is. Thin crust, not deep dish. Okay. New York style. Okay. Okay. I love that you just dig the Chicago in me. <laughs> oh. a- ask me what my favorite food is. Okay. I don't I actually am kind of worried about the answer I'm gonna get, but okay, what's your favorite food? You know, I love that you asked me that question, Tiffany. When I was a kid, I was first generation. In this country, my my family, they immigrated here from South Korea in the late 70s to Chicago. My grandfather was the one who watched me, especially during the summers when there was no school, because my parents had like four different jobs trying to make ends meet. And every day we'd watch days of our lives together. That's how both of us learned how to speak English. And then at 11 o'clock, when it was over, he, my grandpa would turn the TV off and he would look at me and goes, what do you want for lunch? And 99.9% of the times, it was something Korean, right? Because that's what we had in the kitchen, the pantry. That's all my grandfather knew how to cook. One day, I looked at him after he asked me this question, and I said, a cheeseburger. And I remember my grandpa turned back on the TV, and he said, don't move. And he left the house. And I don't know, maybe 15 minutes later, he came back with this big styrofoam box, and in it, was a cheeseburger and french fries. And I remember as a kid being like, wow, that was freaking cool. I asked for this and I got it. Later on, as I grew older, I always reflect on that moment. And I thought about the courage it took. My, my grandpa didn't know how to speak English. He didn't know how the US currency worked. But because his grandchild asked for a cheeseburger, he put himself in an uncomfortable situation to get it done. And I think about the person who took the order who realized, okay, this guy doesn't know how to speak English. He doesn't know how to pay, but I'm going to work with him. We're going to figure out this solution so he gets what he wants, right? I think about how much courage it took from both sides to make that happen. And that's why cheeseburger is my favorite food. Now, Brandon, who do you think you're going to remember? Whose favorite food you'll remember over time? Definitely yours. Oh, right? Yeah, I'll definitely remember yours, um, but I'll remember Tiffany's because I like pizza too. <laughs> <laughs> see but now imagine conveying mm-hmm. that right and not the cheeseburger story but my favorite thing is when i'm at sitting at someone's dining room table right and, and we're talking about listing their home and at the end they ask like well tommy why why should i work with you what makes you different I could say, oh, because I'll work hard and I'll answer every email and I'm going to get it sold for a lot of money. I'll do it quick. That's what everyone will do, right? That's not my value. That's not differentiating myself. When I can tell my story and when I have that, I know which book I need to pull out, which club I need to pull out the bag to play in that situation, that makes a one of one And when they're interviewing two other people, I'm going to be memorable and I'm going to stand out and it gives me a better shot at it. That's why storytelling is so important. And honestly, uh, social media and, cre- and content marketing um, as a strategy, I think is such a great way to amplify your personal brand in storytelling, sharing those unique stories about yourself. And also it's like, 
it's like going to the gym. It gives you that practice to do that, put yourself out there. And it's great because even what's wild about the journey is some of the content that I put out there, that's more, I guess, considered like B2B because I'm talking to real estate agents. I get so many um, consumers reaching out to me about listing their homes. And when I ask like, oh, how did you, who did you, how did you find out about me? Did you, you know, someone refer or whatever? Literally I've had like three or four different times where they said, actually the realtor that helped me buy this place, I noticed commented on one of your posts and said, oh my gosh, this is genius. Like I got to <laughs> use this. I said, why am I working with this person? I wanted to work with the person that they think is a genius. And so even the, the, the agent to agent content, it really attracts uh, more desirability to you from a consumer standpoint. So I always tell people like, don't hold back, you know, and that's the thing. A lot of times what other, t what people are, are held back from putting out that kind of content is they feel like, like they have trade secrets that are like proprietary one-on-one. There's nothing that is uh, unique or one-on-one, right? We've what all done post too much though because like they'll be like i don't want to put myself out there and be rejected the fear of like nobody will comment or like would you just say just start posting I well mean that's that's a, that that i would say it's very it's it's an arrogant way to think because you're assuming that everyone is going to consume and watch your content and i'm telling you no one is going to watch your content at the beginning and that's part of it and sometimes okay. when you have like 100 or 200 people viewing it and people are like all poo-pooing that. I'm like, would you be mad if you stepped on stage and there was 100, 200 people in the audience you're talking to? And they'd be like, no. I'm like, it's the same thing. Like right. some, this idea of virality and people going viral and whatnot, I feel like has made people jaded about, you know, uh, how many people are viewing and liking and commenting. You know, if one person liked and commented, then great. Like that's yeah. a huge win in my book. Because you never know if that one person who they're going to introduce you to and what doors that could open. Mm -hmm. And so so you just say, and obviously don't just spew a bunch of stuff that's like not relevant. But if so, so would your advice be just start like engage, don't have, and also don't be perfect. Like don't worry about it looking a certain way. Just start putting yourself out there and yes. showing up who you are. Put yourself out there. And what I would say is, Here's here's a here's a pro tip and a hack. If you're like, what am I gonna say? Make content for the younger version of you. What would you make that would help day one Tiffany or day one Brandon in the real estate industry? And that'll start inspiring you. And what'll happen is sometimes you'll hit a little wall and you start to think like, this is so basic. Everyone knows what a property inspection is. No, you're wrong. The knowledge gap between you and the average consumer or a new agent is really wide. And the most basic stuff, that's the stuff that people love. That's stuff that people really engage with. So I'd say just make content for the younger version of you and just put yourself out there. Don't worry about if it's edited nicely and whatnot. You wanna make sure there's captions. You want to make sure there's always trending music uh, in the background. Uh, but outside of that, just put it, put yourself out there and you learn from it. The, the, the beauty in this is the more content you put out there, the more of a catalog you have to do your own research on yourself and say like, okay, this video really did well in engagement. Why did it? Right. And you really dissect it. And then you can say, okay, cool. Now I know I'm just going to do something like this with a different topic. Right. And then you can constantly get better and push yourself uh, to really grow. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll rem I remember a story that you and I had, even though when I started putting out little videos and, you know, I, I've always, and this is probably the attorney in me that wants to put out like whatever I'm going to put out, I'm going to have like a, you know, bunch of information. I'm going to hold on tight to it so I don't forget anything because I want it to be valuable. If I'm speaking, I want somebody to get value from that. And so 
I remember as I started putting out the videos, you said to me, just be authentic, right? Again, like it doesn't matter even that you're so perfect or what you're saying is so scripted, but I'm like, but I want to get the information out that like, if I'm going to quote NRS 645.282, I want to have the exact definition. And you're like, you know it, just like talk about it, right? Yeah. Like don't be so rigid. And so I think that that was great advice for me of just, I'm still working on it. I'm still a work yeah. in progress, but you know what else helps is one of the biggest game changers. Um, um, gentleman, his name is Mo Ismail. He's one of my good buddies, and he's like the guru of content marketing, and he's coached me up in it. And a big thing that um, helped me that I'll share with everyone here is like when you are looking at the camera and you're speaking, mm -hmm. don't speak like you're on stage and you're like, presenting to the masses, like speak like you would if you were sitting down at a buyer consultation or a listing appointment one-on-one -on -one with a seller, how would you speak to them? Because that's where the authenticity and the connection is made when someone on the other side of the phone is watching and it feels like, oh my gosh, like Brandon is talking to me right now and I you really stay engaged. And that really helps because early on in my content, I would be very like, like all like dramatic and like, yes. And like, you know, like should like, throwing my voice out there like I'm on stage, but when you can be more intimate and kind of be one-on-one -on -one like this, I'm just talking to you, that's where it really um, goes next level too. Mm -hmm. I love that's that. That's interesting. I, I was uh, talking with uh, a gentleman in another market that is starting to get a good business off of YouTube. <clears throat> and he said, uh, he said where it shifted for him was when he stopped talking to you guys to talking to you. Yes. And so, and it was almost instant that the lead started to come in. Hmm. Yeah. It's so like you have in 2024, you, ha you have to have some sort of digital online presence. I think the challenge is a lot of people now, because after the pandemic, there's all these like young realtors who have done well in like one or two years. And now they're like, you know, life coach. Right. And they're like pitching like, oh, like, here's how you go viral on social and yada, yada, yada. It, to be something that I, the principle that I put into our business is like, we are the modern real estate professional. And what it means to be a modern real estate professional is that you're blending the online digital with the offline traditional. You have to do both. And they dove, dovetail and complement each other, right? You can make content Put out videos, short, short form or even long form on YouTube. You can write short form written content on um, on X or Threads or LinkedIn, Facebook. But if you're not picking up the phone and reaching out to people, uh, making getting face to face, it, it you're not really doing all the digital stuff justice. Because what happens is when I lead generate every day, and I still pick up the phone and call my database and sphere. The first thing they do is celebrate my content. They'll be like, oh my gosh, dude, I love your videos, right? And now they're telling me and showing to me that they're paying attention, right? And it gives you that opportunity to make that additional level of connection. That's and and whether, you know, I'll share my hack. Whether it's the digital side or the um offline traditional side of things, right? Being a modern real estate professional, it comes down to relationships, right? And how I've mastered or on this path of mastery when it comes to relationships is I look at relationships like a ATM machine, okay? And what I mean by that, and for anyone that's the younger millennials that are listening, ATM machine is like a brick and mortar Venmo or cash app. It's like a physical place we would go to to get money out. They still exist. But you can even say Venmo, right? If I'm meeting you, Brandon, for the first time, you look like an ATM machine to me in the sense of this. Once I've established that you're not a jerk or an asshole and I want to build a relationship with you, I have two options, just like pulling up to an ATM machine, right? Your two options are you can make a withdrawal, take money out of an account, or you can make a deposit and put money into your account. That's relationship 101. I can at that moment make a withdrawal and take out of this relationship. Maybe it's like ask for a referral, your personal business and introduction, or 
I could lead with value and make a deposit into this relationship, right? And a lot of the times there's apprehension around lead generation, right? People are like uncomfortable calling, texting, reaching out to people, even like on Facebook. What it comes down to is, you know, they ultimately feel, what have I done for this person that they should do something for me? And I think that's a very important feeling to download, right? All these alpha bros out there and like culture, culture, or hustle culture will be like, like, like sweep those feelings under the rugs. You're in sales. Like if you don't like it, then get out right No, That's BS. You really have to understand that feeling. When you break that down, it comes down to like, I haven't done something for him. So why would I ask them to do something for me? And that's real. And so the hack around that is, cool, before you make a withdrawal, then make some deposits into this relationship. And once you've made, provided value, you built up this relationship capital and trust that this person will allow you to make a withdrawal. And for me, right, I'm not trying to make like a $20 withdrawal from a relationship. I go for broke and I want to max out that daily limit. And the beauty is because of all the value I provide to the people in my world, they're willing to, they're allowing me, they hand me their ATM card and their pin and say, dude, have at it, right? That's a beauty in relationships. And that's where when you blend the offline traditional side of getting face-to-face, -face, breaking bread, making phone calls, the voice to voices with the online digital content marketing strategy, you're ultimately making deposits nonstop. My content, when I provide educational value, I'm making deposits, right? When I can get, we're a very events-driven team. When I can invite someone to celebrate, um, to come to an event, maybe it's like picking up a pie during Thanksgiving, when I can make connections uh, and help solve other people's problems, they will solve my problems, which that is, I want more opportunity, right? I want more real estate conversations. I want more at-bats. I want to see more pitches. So when you find ways to make deposits, everything else will work itself out, right? And it's just finding those ways to amplify your personal brand so that you can make as many deposits as possible. And you have to do both. You have to be that modern real estate professional in order to survive and thrive in this market. So Tommy, have you gotten into coaching lately? Because I'd love to also make sure that our listeners have a takeaway of how they can reach you, get in contact with you, what you can help them in with their business. Are you actually working one-on-one, -on -one, larger scale? Like, how are you sharing your wealth? About? Yeah. No, I appreciate you asking that. Yeah, I uh, I started a, a coaching uh, company for uh, real estate agents and also loan officers called Growth Only Coaching, Go Coaching, uh, with uh, my buddy Amir Syed, Justin Lapatin, Mo Ismail, uh, Stephanie Lavelle is another agent coach on the agent side. Um, we have 700 plus um, in our Go Coaching community nationwide. And so, you know, it's where we're at. That's what we're coaching on is how to be a modern real estate professional, how to have a sustainable business that's referral based where you're top of mind because you are like a local celebrity, right, for uh, your database. And, you know, the beauty, though, in coaching in general is I always say it's like for me, right? And we do one-on-ones. We do have group cohort coaching, right? We have different master classes every month. Um, but what the beauty in coaching is, it's you can someone can learn from my 17 years of experience without having to age 17 years. It's like time traveling, you know. And that's why I think it's so important. Like I said at the top of the hour, right? The bit is, the greatest accelerator in life is through people, and when you can align through people, it helps and fuels your, your growth and acceleration. And a lot of the times too, that's the other thing, you know, coaching is like people think like, and this is even in like fitness, right? Like, okay, you, you pay to be a part of this program. Now it's just going to happen, but yeah. no, you got to do the work, right? You got to be held accountable. You have to know which direction you want to be going in and uh, do the work. And that's where the magic happens. Well, that's exciting. And I hope that our listeners take advantage of looking into that. So is it a website that they go to or how can they get more information? Just Google that. Yeah, gocoaching.io um, or just follow me on Instagram. 
It's my first name, middle name, last name, Tommy, Ju, J-O-O, Choi, C-H-O-I. And you can always shoot me a DM. I'm always happy to uh, get on a call with anyone. Awesome. Thank you, Tommy. And if there's one takeaway, one pro tip, one piece of tactical advice, anything that you can leave our listeners with, how to seize the day in this modern world right now, what would that be? I would say you have to be right now the economist of choice for your client, right? You have to be like the Dr. Lawrence Yoon for your sphere. That means being able to understand the market trends, the data, and convey that and be that source for your, um, your database. And when you do that, people always come to you because you're positioning yourself as that subject matter expert. Well, thank you so much, Tommy, for joining us today. I know how much Brandon and I appreciate it. Um, if you've liked our content, we're actually giving away some swag. So that's why I wore my hat today, um, because we want you to like and subscribe and follow so that we make sure that our members um, have the most valuable up-to-date information coming directly from the source at the Nevada Realtors. And so, and we'll be sure to enter you in a giveaway to win all of our new swag. Um, and Tommy, you owe me a hat. Next time I see you, I probably owe you a hat. Yes, you do. So make sure we do a hat swap and um, thank you all for joining. And thanks, Tommy, so much for spending some time with us today. Thanks for having me.